Now I'm recording. All right. So yeah, today we are going to take a look at um, complex waves and looking at the uh, what happens when the waves are incident on a boundary uh, between two different media. Uh, and that's going to be something that we'll then do later on once, once we get into um, electromagnetic waves. And that's, the, again, like the beginning of optics right there. Um, and then we'll start talking about electromagnetic waves. And that, that'll be the point where I dance. Um, so let's start off uh, and uh, take a look. Um, we were, oops, I'm sorry. Um, taking a look at our electromagnetic waves. And we said in, in not sorry, we were looking at waves in general, complex waves. Um, so we had some F, oh, and we were calling this Z. And I'm, my apologies. And we had a cosine. Like that. But we said it was actually a lot easier for us to write this uh, as a complex function. like this um, with a complex amplitude. And a complex amplitude included real amplitude, but also um, included that phase factor and the phase constant. And so then to look at f, the actual function, all we have to do is take the real part of this right here. So we can say again that like that. All right, so we're gonna start off with this idea again, um, but now what we're gonna do is take a look at um, what happens if we've got two different uh, media. Um, so here, let me draw, I'll draw it down here. So we're gonna have Over on this side, material one. And over on this side, material two. Right. And the line right there is the interface that, that separates them. So here, I'll call this one. Whoops. Stop it. Sorry. Trouble with my pen. One and two, like that. Perfect. What does delta mean again in this scenario? Yeah, so delta is is what we call a, a phase constant. So it's kind of like uh, how much of a phase delay do we have? Or actually a phase advancement. Um, uh, so um, if your wave is uh, advanced by a quarter of a cycle, that would be delta would be equal to pi over four. If it's delayed by a quarter of a cycle, um, we'd have uh, delta is minus pi over four. A full half of a wavelength would be uh, pi. Right? So it takes into account that the wave can be shifted ahead or backwards a little bit. Does that help out? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. Good, good, good. And, and yeah, I, I want to make sure that everyone's understanding this stuff before we get into it too, too much. Um, so what we're going to do in this situation right here is <clears throat> we're going to have our wave. Oops, let's get this here. Yeah, and I'll do it in a different color, being too fancy. Our wave is going to come in. Oops, again, wrong, wrong pen. like this, right? And then some of it's gonna keep going into the new material, like that, but some of it's gonna bounce back off. And right now we're just gonna all have this in one dimension. I've drawn them a little bit separated from each other vertically, but we're just, 
we're going to think of these as, as, as all just traveling along a straight line, just forward or backwards. Um, so I showed it coming from within material one uh, from the left and then continuing off into material two to the right or bouncing back and reflecting back in material one going off to the left. Um, we could turn this all around, but what we, we're going to do is, you know, because this matches a lot of physically relevant scenarios, we're going to have the wave originating just in one of the two materials, right? And so we might as well have that one, material one, right? And so we can write down, there are actually three different waves corresponding to the three different lines we have, you know, all originating from that original incident wave. And so um, here, we're just going to call the, sorry, the boundary right here, we call that z equals zero. Oops, right there. Um, and so uh, let's write out the equation just like we did um, at the start. Let's write out the equation that though for each one of these waves right here. So coming um, from the left, right, we've got the incident wave. supposed to be a W wave, right? So I'm going to write this just like we wrote earlier, um, F of Z and T as a complex function, except now I've got to label it because we're going to have an incident wave, a transmitted wave, a reflected wave. So we're going to label it like that. And so it will have its own complex amplitude. And its own uh, wave number and a frequency, right? And so this is present for z less than zero, right? And so notice I didn't actually label the frequency with its own, um, with its own index. And we'll come back to that in just a second. And so, also from the left, right, we're going to have the, um, oh, I'm sorry, also heading towards the left. We're going to have the reflected wave. Same thing, we're going to write out complex function for this wave. It's got an amplitude of its own, not going to be the same amplitude. Okay. Oh, and I, I didn't, I actually want to change my labeling. I, I wasn't thinking this through. I'm going to call the wave number of the incident wave. I'm going to make a little change here. Bip. And bit. So that's the wave number in material one is what we're going to call it. And so the reflected wave right here is going to have the same wave number. It, it, it's this originating from the same wave. It'll have the same wave length. So it has the same wave number, except it is going to the left. So notice I put a minus sign on there. So that indicates that it is going leftward now but it has the same wave number. And then also from the left, we have the transmitted wave. What is the difference between incident and transmitted? Yeah, so the incident wave is while it's in material one. Okay, um, and so the transmitted wave is once it's past the boundary and entered into material two. So that's going to be z greater than zero. And here, let, let me write out the equation. We can see how it's going to be different. So the transmitted complex wave function. Right, so first of all, it could have a different amplitude, right, because not all the wave will pass into the new material, that's supposed to be the tilde on top. 
Now I'm going to write this E. It's going to be a positive K, but it will have a different wave number. And so why does the wave number change? The wave number changes because the speed of the wave in the material might be different, right? Well, okay, still, why does that, how does that, so maybe the wave number stays the same, but the speed changes. One thing that we're going to have is the wave propagates because there's a disturbance in the medium of some kind that creates a new disturbance, which creates a new disturbance and travels along. And so each of those disturbances, though, are oscillating at some, at that frequency omega. Um, and so that means that everywhere, the wave is going to oscillate with that same frequency. So the frequency on one side of the boundary is equal to the frequency on the other side of the boundary. So we're just going to call that omega right there. All right? Because, right, again, um, if you were to imagine like a piece of string or something like that, right, well, how does the wave travel down the string? Well, as one piece goes up and down, that makes a piece next to it go up and down, which makes a piece next to it go up and down, et cetera, even on that boundary, right? And so they all have to be going up and down with the same frequency. Um, so then the waves have different speeds in there. Well, we also know something about the relationship between their frequency, um, their speed, and their wave number. And that is specifically that the frequency is going to be wave number one times velocity one times, which is equal to wave number two times velocity two, right? And so we can write ratios of these things right here, right? So that K2, K1, if you wanted to, um, would be equal to, well, it's going to be basically inversely proportional to our speeds. And it's also inversely proportional to our wavelengths. And you can kind of think of it this way. If they've got the same frequency, then as you go up and down, the up-down motion will travel. If it's got a faster speed, the up-down motion will travel farther um, if there's a faster speed, and that will lead to a faster wavelength. I mean, a longer wavelength, pardon me, right? And so now with all this stuff right here, we can do a couple things. We can, let's write out the total wave function. Not wave function like in quantum mechanics, but the total function representing this wave. Um, so obviously it's got to be piecewise because there's stuff defined before, you know, to the left of Z, Z negative, and to the right of Z, Z positive. Right? So we're going to need piecewise function. So we'll have on the left, these waves, right, we get a linear combination. Oh, I'm sorry about this. P to the I, K1. That's for negative z's on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we just have the transmitted wave. So we're taking our, our method for writing out complex functions for waves, um, and we're doing this now, and we're looking at just the, the physical sequence of wave comes in, some of it goes through the boundary, some of it bounces off. And so we're, we're combining them. Right? And then there's a couple other bits of physics that are going to impose some mathematical constraints on us. And they're going to be really, really important to, for us to tell what happens to the wave when it reflects, what happens when it transmits. Um, and so, whoops, here's what it is. So the, the function that we've defined um, and its derivative. 
have to be continuous. All right, and so we can write that out as a math as mathematical expressions. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look just to the left and just to the right of of z equals zero. And so, oops, pardon me. In math as a mathematical expression, what we're saying is that function, that total function right there. If we look at position zero just to the left of z equals zero at some time, that also has to be equal to what the function is just to the right. That's what zero plus and zero minus is. It's basically just to the left side of zero and just to the right side of zero. And so what that means is right at zero, at z equals zero, we're, we, we can um, use Notice I just said this was for z less than zero. This is for z greater than zero. Well, which one describes what's happening at z equals zero, right? Shouldn't one of them be less than two or the other one greater than or equal to zero? To zero? Really what this continuity equation uh, condition is saying is that this one right here, the top half is for less than or equal to, and this one right here, is for greater than or equal to. So right at that point where they overlap, they have to be equal to each other. And then let's write the second condition, the fact that the derivatives have to be continuous. Then we'll talk about why. All right, so what does it mean for the derivatives to be continuous? That means that the partial of complex F with respect to Z, if we evaluate that just to the left, of z equals zero has to be equal to the partial with respect to z if we evaluate that just to the right. Or again, if we take the derivatives of the first part of the piecewise function and the second part of the piecewise function at z equals zero, they have to be equal to each other. All right, and so to talk about why this has to be true, well, the first thing is like we can think of like mechanical type waves, things that we're used to seeing to begin with, right? Imagine, you know, a good reference is a piece of string. So imagine a piece of string, right? Even if there's a boundary, right, where the, you go from, say, a light string to a heavy string, but they're still tied together, then you always, they still stay connected, right? If they didn't stay connected, then the thing would come apart and you wouldn't have a wave anymore or anything like that, right? Um, you wouldn't have a continuous medium, right? or you wouldn't even have like continuous space, even if there is a change in what the medium is. Better way to say that. Okay. So again, in order for us to have this continuously propagating wave, it not tear space apart, um, we have this continuity of the function itself. Let's talk about the derivative right here, and we'll use example. Um, uh, of the string. Um, so here, I'm going to draw off on the side right here. So normally on uh, you know, a little wave of the string right here, it's going like this, like this, right? And we can take a look at the tension um, just around one little infinitesimal bit of the string right here. So that little bit right there. So I, if I look at the tension right there, the tension points along the string, and so it's going to be tension pointing like this and tension pointing like that, right? And you combine them and you get some net infinitesimal that points downwards, but just by an infinitesimal amount, because there's an infinitesimal amount of curvature right there. Um, if it wasn't the case, what would happen if the derivative wasn't wasn't continuous, right? What would happen if our, for that little bit of, whoops, let me change the color back for string. What would happen if for this little bit of string right here, that's a little bit, but the wave itself was kind of like this and like this, right, right there, right? So that, that you had a cusp, a pointy part. Right? So what would you get right there? Well, you would get, again, tension pointing like this, 
and some tension pointing like this. And then their resultant is going to be something that's not at all infinitesimal. So here, I'm going to draw the resultant in red for both cases. So over here in red is this tiny, tiny, right? So F1 vector plus F2, this vector gives us some df over here. Whereas over here, the net force is really just some f net that's not at all infinitesimal points down like that. Right? And so um, for that little bit of string, right? that little bit of string has got, say, it's got some length dz. Right? So that means it's got some mass dm for both cases. dm is equal to lambda, where that's the linear mass density times dz, right? And so we also know that f equals ma. So on the left-hand side, right, our net force is df would be equal to lambda dz times a. And because df is infinite and dz is an infinitesimal, we get a regular normal finite a. Whereas over here, we'd have this big finite a force is equal to a little infinitesimal dm times a. So a would have to be infinite in order for the product of an infinite uh, infinitesimal dm times some quantity to give a finite force. Right. So that wouldn't work. Yes. Can I write that out? OK. Um, give me a moment um, to let me do this on a, a different s uh, slide. Yeah, let me take a snapshot of, of this, and then I'm going to, I don't know. Yeah, I should have left more space. Um, Give me one second. Oh. Oh, wrong place. Pardon me. Take me a moment. Okay, so here, let me just wipe this out. So here, I'm gonna draw two situations. Whoops. One is the situation with a continuous string, and the other one where there's an abrupt discontinuity where that little bit is. And here's my little dm right there. And so I'm just giving us back up to speed. So, yeah. Okay, so that's our situations right there. Um, and so here, right, we've got F net equals M A. And so we're talking about that little piece of string right there. So another way to, the little bit that is 
right here to where the the tension is pulling on right and then we can repeat the argument for the ne next piece over and the next piece over and the next piece over etc but for this little bit right here we've got f net equals m a but another way to write this is f net is an infinitesimal df and our mass is an infinitesimal dm and so that's equal to a and so then we can solve for a and say a equals uh, df dm that's finite right take an infinitesimal divided by another infinitesimal and it's quite plausible to get a finite quantity so over here right we're going to have f i'm just going to jump right to the to the second line that is equal to our mass um I'm sorry uh, to the third line dm times a right and so if i rewrite that we've got a equals f net over dm so we've got a finite quantity divided by an infinitesimal So that would be infinite acceleration, uh, which would lead to infinite velocity, infinite energy, kablamo, right? That just doesn't work. Um, and so Oops. Move this. This ran off the edge, I see. Oh, it doesn't let me move it. Acceler uh, infinite energy, acceleration, and so on, right? Are we? It's, it's not like a rigorous mathematical proof, but it, it's invoking ideas from physics to support this. Kind of happy with that? Maybe not perfectly happy. Give me one second. I'm snapshotting this. We say, oh, all right, I got a thumbs up. All right. All right. So those are called the continuity conditions at the boundary. Um, so we apply them, right? Because we've got our functions now. So I'm going to wipe this out, right? So, right. So let's start for the first one, the the continuity of the function itself, right? Um, so that's going to tell us then that this complex function to the left of the boundary is equal to the complex function to the right of the boundary, right? And so what that implies then is okay so we're what we're doing is we're sticking in zero for z right there and we can choose whatever time we want um here i'll you know what i'm going to write out the, the equation all, all the way pardon me um let's write it out all the way just so we can see what's going on we've got whoops that's supposed to be a tilde incident e to the i k1 times zero minus omega t plus a reflected amplitude e to the i minus k1 and again at z equals zero That's going to be equal to our transmitted complex amplitude times e to the i k2, but that doesn't matter because it's times is at z equals zero also. So notice everywhere we, we've got the we've got all the k terms, all the, the z terms went to zero because z equals zero. And then the other thing is every single one of these. Um, 
we can factor out a common uh, term, which is the e to the minus i omega t, right? And so now what we're left with then is just the fact that this incident amplitude plus the reflected complex amplitude is equal to the transmitted complex amplitude right there. So that's the first result. And this is true, like we haven't said anything about these waves except for that they, they just have a single wave number in free. But beyond that, nothing else. All right, a single wave number in each medium, right? Different wave number for medium one versus medium two. So now let's take a look at the continuity of the derivative, that condition. What does that tell us? make those tildos a little bit more squiggly. Can we hand wave that result through the conservation of energy? Um, hmm. The only thing I'd say is, is, is you'd have to pay a little bit of, of attention. Um, be, for example, if you're talking about electromagnetic waves, right, the different materials might have different uh, permittivities, and so it's not as obvious that that would that that would be true, right? You would have suppose you're going from air to some other material, then you would have energy would be saying something about you know one half epsilon times uh, e squared, um, but you'd have different epsilons for the two sides. And yes, it, 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 it's very similar, it's related, but it's, it's not, I'm not sure it's a, you can, I think you need one more information before you can say that directly. It's coming from con conservation energy. Um, so here's the, the second part, right? What does this tell us here? Well, if we were to take the derivative of this with respect to Z, but sorry, I'm pointing with something you can't see. We take the derivative of this function with respect to Z, but leaving this as a Z before we plug it in, right? We get down a factor of I times K1. All right, so I get I K1. And then we're going to evaluate it after we take the derivative, um, evaluate it at z equals zero. So this becomes k1 times zero minus omega t. And then over here, notice we had a minus k1 times i. Whoops, minus i k1. And now we evaluate it at z equals zero. And then for the this one here, again, take the derivative with respect to z, you get i k2. And then we evaluate the function though at z equals zero. So again, in our exponentials, the, the spatial part, the part that has the wave numbers, is well we just get a zero and e to the zero gives us one as a multiplicative factor and then we've got a common factor of e to the minus i omega t so that's just going to cancel out throughout and so what we're left with after all that is i oops and we also notice there's a common factor of i so let's take out the the i's as well so i'm going to get rid of my i and so i've got K1, and that multiplies both terms on the left hand side. A I tilde, and then, but we also picked up a minus sign for the second term. And this, I'm sorry, this was supposed to be the reflected wave. Reflected. That, and this is equal to K2, a transmitted. And so, all right, so now we've got two different equations to work with that that relate the different um, 
complex amplitude. So we've got that one, and we got that one right there. Problem is, and so they relate them in terms of the other amplitudes, but also the properties of the, of the material, properties of the wave and the material. Our wave number is going to depend on the frequency. Once you've got the frequency, then the speed of the wave and the material is, is the property of the material. So the wave number comes from that. Um, so the problem is these are just kind of, it's a big mishmash of all the things mixed together. Um, and so it's a lot easier um, to take these. Um, and we're going to find the reflected and transmitted amplitudes uh, in terms of the incident amplitude and properties of the material. All right. So usually, right, because it, that, that way is it aligns more with our causal line of thinking, right? You send in a wave. And let's see what happens after that. Some some of it gets reflected, some of it gets transmitted, depending on the materials, right? So we're going to, our, our derived quantity is going to be the reflected and transmitted amplitudes. So um, it basically do a little bit of, do a bunch of algebra to, to rearrange things um, in the system of equations. And you get this right here. Difference over the sum proportional to the amplitude of the wave that you sent in. And also, right, you've got to do the same thing for the transmitted wave. Oops. Okay. So again, we we're taking kind of as our independent quantities, right? The what do we send in? And then here these wave numbers have to do with the materials and the frequency of the of the incident wave. Um, we can write this a different way, right? Um, oops. Right, so we could just rewrite these in terms of the speed of the waves in the middle. And that then isn't dependent on the frequency, well, to, to lowest order, right? In the regime that we're working right here, right? So we're going to say that this reflected amplitude is, notice that because of that inverse proportionality, every, the placement of each of these things, speed two versus speed one is reversed as compared to K1 and K2. Oops, that's this. Ah, I'm sorry, I was supposed to be V2. Okay, and so what this is saying is um, how much gets reflected. Uh, are those tildes or vector signs? Those are simply right tildes, yeah. My, okay. my apologies. It's, are these all tildes everywhere? They're all tildes everywhere. Yeah, we haven't gotten, right now we're just dealing with a one dimensional, like, uh, you know, scalar quantity. And then we're going to generalize it in a moment um, to vectors. 
but yeah, everything's right. filled out. Yeah, sorry about the the, the poor resolution. Um, no, I'm just I was just making sure. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, good good stuff. Much appreciated. Um, so notice right here whether anything gets reflected right here depends on the difference in the property of materials, and if there's no difference in the two speeds, right, then this goes to zero, nothing gets reflected. And the trans, if there's no difference in the, 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 in the two speeds, if V1 is equal to V2, then 2V2 is equal to V2 plus V1 if, the, if these two things are equal. So you just get an overall factor of one, so the transmitted intensity is equal to, the, I'm sorry, the transmitted amplitude is equal to the uh, reflected amplitude. So here, let me go like, um, Yeah, yeah. So Harry was. So this is the first part right here, and then I'm going to make a comment um, here. Let's change color for this one right here, um, and here, right here, right, with no mismatch. And then. In, in Harry's comment, right, so uh, if there's no mismatch b between the materials, we can really just say, hey, it's all the same material, right? And so we could pick and draw the boundary anywhere within that material. And we know that if there's, that should just keep going. It's not going to arbitrarily, like, suddenly shrink some of it and suddenly bounce some of it backwards, right? So in a continuous material, it just keeps going. Uh, transmitted amplitudes, the same as the incident amplitude, nothing gets reflected back. It's only when there's a change in the materials. And notice it could be we could have speeding up or down. Um, for example, right, if the speed is greater in the second material, then you'll get an amplitude that that is in phase, right, because you get V2 minus V1 still a positive number. So it might be a different magnitude, but it's still in phase. But if you go from a faster material into a slower material, if v1 is bigger than v2 then this be, you pick up a minus sign in addition to a change in magnitude and what does a minus sign do that reverses the amplitude right so that is 180 degrees or pi out of phase for the incident wave so and you might have seen this right? if you take a wave on a string and you go from a heavy string to a light string um, or if you do it so that it is, um, if you're going from, uh, have a string attached to a, a ring on a pole, send a wave down, then you'll get a wave coming back that that's, looks the same. Um, it's just a reflection back. But if you take this, if you ha go from a, uh, a heavy, I said that backwards, light to heavy, you go from a light to heavy string um, backwards. Um, if you have a string that's tied to a point on the wall, you send in a wave, the reflected wave comes back with, uh, you know, inverted so that it has the opposite phase. So we can take the limiting condition where we either have, uh, uh, where you have, you know, when one of the Vs goes to zero or infinity versus the other one, relative to the other one. Zero or infinity, I guess. Um, cool. So, and this is going to be true, right? Notice this wasn't about necessarily E and M waves. I was talking about this with um, string waves as you go from like one density string to another density string. Same thing will actually happen with water waves. Water waves, if you go from 
um, the water waves, unless it, the water is incredibly deep, so long as the water depth is comparable to the wavelength of the waves, then the speed of the wave depends on the depth of the water. So anywhere where you've got, if there's a pool where there's like a sudden drop off, um, or you know, like you've got a continental shelf or something like that, you'll get reflection of waves, even though they're not hitting a barrier, they're just changing their speeds sudden, abruptly. As a the as a depth change up, they'll get reflections back and forth. Um, in uh, when you're sending radio signals or through cables or something like that, you have to make sure that you always match the impedance along the cable or from one component to another component as you transmit them along. Otherwise, you'll get reflections backwards. Same thing, light as it travels, different speeds in different materials, right? And so if you go from one material into another material, you'll get a reflection. So how do you know that there's a piece of glass that you're looking through, like a window that you're looking through, um, particularly if it's kind of dark out and it's light on the inside? Well, it doesn't matter how good the glass is. If you look at it, you'll see some reflection, right? And the transmitted light won't be quite in, as intense either. So cool. Th so this is universal properties with waves. Oh, and if you've done quantum mechanics, um, same thing. If there's a sudden step uh, in the in your potential, you can get reflections off of that, even if the wave is completely above the barrier. Um, and so I'm just saving this right here. Wave on interface. Yes. Um, Cool. Um, so let's talk now um, about actually different kinds of waves, right? I just said, hey, we can get reflections anytime there's a sudden change in the properties of the material. You can get reflections and not all the wave transmitted. Let's take a look at different kinds of waves in general, right? And this is something hopefully you learned about like in middle school, high school and stuff like that, that there are different kinds of waves. Um, Right, we can have here longitudinal waves. Um, and so the example some examples of that is like a, in a spring, like in a slinky. Right. So there what you'll get are areas of rarefication, alternating with areas of compression and rarification and compression oh i forgot that you couldn't see as i was drawing it so i was dictating what i was drawing but whoop, it all appeared all at once for you right so that's um uh one way oh and so what does longitudinal mean it just means along the direction of propagation So in the case of this slinky wave, right, the compression waves are traveling along that way, right? And we see the same thing for sound waves too, right? Same thing for sound, right? You've got areas of rarefication alternating with areas of compression. And rarefication, this is hard to do with this. Areas where it's more dense, compression, and rarefication. Right. And again, so this is getting compressed this way or, or like this, but the overall travel is down along like that. Of this disturbance. And so this is all in contrast with the transverse wave. Transverse. Right, and transverse is uh, going to be perpendicular to the propagation direction. 
right? <laughs> um, and so the example for that is a wave on a string, right? right. Going like that, and the waves traveling down that way. Right. So, you know, to 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 spoil the punchline, um, E and M waves are going to be transverse waves in free space, so long as we don't have boundaries. Um, uh, so we're let's take a look at how we actually describe these transverse waves. So is that what so that's what we're going to spend a whole bunch of time on it. So there's two different directions um, that are transverse to it. So um, Right, so here. Right, because we live in three dimensional space. So if propagation is oriented around along one of our axes. There are two other axes that are perpendicular to it. Um, so, for example, right? Suppose we're imagining a wave that's going straight into your computer screen, right? Straight into uh, this whiteboard right here. Then, two different directions. For example, we could choose any two we want, so long as they're orthogonal to each other. We might call them, in this case, kind of a standard orientation would be vertical and horizontal. Um, and so, like, if we say that our wave's going in the z direction, we could talk about a vertical part, right? Um, Call that x hat right there, and a horizontal part, and a complex number. That's supposed to be a tilde. Like, right, and. But of course, we also know that if we've got two different solutions to our wave equation, then a linear combination of them will be two. Um, so in general, right, we can write a linear combination And I'm going to indicate this direction with an n hat, a unit vector right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to call that which transverse direction the, the disturbance uh, is oriented. We're going to call that the polarization vector. Right. So. One of the things um, we can say is the fact that it's transverse, right, means that the polarization has to be perpendicular to the direction it's traveling. And so we had it traveling in the z direction. You can see that from the exponent, the e to the i kz minus omega t. So if they're perpendicular, their dot product has to be equal to zero. So I can do a linear combination of these. Um, and if I want to keep it so that this polarization vector is always um, is always a unit vector, right? I can write it this way. So here's my f of z t um, equals a tilde. So I can write it in terms of uh, the x and y polarizations, for example. So to keep it. Um, as a unit vector, 
I'm using cosine and sine of theta. Like that. So by using this cosine and sine, right, that keeps it so that really my my n hat, the polarization vector, is cosine of theta x hat plus sine of theta y hat. Right. And that makes it so it's always a unit vector. Why? Because if you take the magnitude, you'll get the square root of uh, a tilde, right? A, oh, but but it's just I'm sorry. You'll get the square root of cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta, which is equal to square root of one. So magnitude of, of one, right? And so what does it mean? So if we say x is the vertical direction, um, if you look at the little mini window um, of me in the video, right? The, the uh, function, this is x, it's going up and down, it's oscillating up and down like this, right? And so, and the Y polarization would correspond to this, because Y is our horizontal direction going like this, right? And so if we combine a little bit of this with a little bit of this and go back down like this, we end up with something that's going like this, right? And depending on the relative magnitude, we could have it oscillating like this and like this. But notice, right, what we've said here is, is the wave itself is propagating into the screen, into the screen. So all these oscillations like this are still perpendicular to that propagation direction. So we can have polarization at all these different angles. Are we okay with that? Because I'm about to throw it for a loop. Yes. Exactly, staying alive, right? Polarization dance right here. You can tell by the way I use my walk. Um, anyways, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit more complicated. I'm actually going to say, well, there's no reason to say that the X and Y have to be in phase with each other. So we're gonna add in another parameter that lets it gives us even more freedom. So this part looks exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, I know. More freedom means more power, but it also means more complicated. With great power comes, yeah. Right, you're like, nothing's changed. Ah, here comes the change. Right, so I had the same complex amplitude, but now we're adding in an extra phase factor. So we can have a phase difference between the X and Y components. So the X and Y components aren't necessarily oscillating together, right? I was doing this before, right, where they state, but I could have it being like out of phase, right? They're kind of doing it different, different points of their oscillations. And so in particular, right, so notice that, that we can reproduce what we had in the line above it. So if we take phi equals zero, zero phase difference, we just recover what we had before, right? But for example, right, let's see what happens when phi is equal to pi over two. So a 90 degree phase difference. So they're a quarter wavelength delayed from each other. So we're gonna take the vertical going like this, and so when the vertical is at its maximum, the horizontal is gonna be doing nothing. It's at zero. Then as vertical retreats from its maximum, we grow, the horizontal grows out to the maximum this way. So notice I'm pointing off to the side. And then as this comes down from its maximum, the vertical goes to its negative maximum. So what's the net of all of this? Which, what is the trend that if I were to take the resultant, what pattern would these trace out? So it's my left, I guess your right, up, left, 
down. What, what do we call that pattern? So it traces out a circle, right? It was from here up to kind of 45 degrees to net over there to net of 45 degrees when they're both part way to down to net of 45 of, you know, whatever the other 45 degrees, right? And so the overall, what it's doing is this going around and around and around in a circle. And that was with one, you know, with, with vertical uh, being 90 degrees of phase, so pi over two ahead of horizontal. If it was the other way around, if horizontal was ahead of vertical, then what we would get would be this, then this, then this, then this, right? It would be a circle going the other way, right? And so, um, in particular, right, we can say, uh, I don't know what a space, but I'm going to do this here. Zero, right? It's different linear polarizations with the, 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 with the angle being set by what theta is. And when phi is equal to pi over two, Actually, I'm going to do one thing. Not just pi over 2, but let's say plus or minus pi over 2. Then what we get is left or right. Circular. Woo! So those two, so we can have circular polarizations too, so long as there's the, the appropriate phase delay. And what happens, and so notice that we still had, um, oh, so that's for this right here, but one other condition, right? That's, and also, theta equals plus or minus pi over four. Right, we have to have equal amplitudes of those things. So what happens if we've got a different, um, if a different phase delay, or if there's different amounts of the vertical and horizontal polarization, you can get some sort of combination of circular and linear. In fact, you could break, you could decompose it into a circular component and a linear component. And so what happens when you kind of mix together a circle and a um, and a line? You get an a stretched out circle, an ellipse. So other kinds of polarization, kind of in between these 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 two extremes, are called elliptical polarization. Okay. Um, for and in fact, right? So. Um, this is starting to get a little bit relevant, right, to some of the stuff that um, we're learning about uh, that Camille and Nate are doing in Advanced Lab, right, with the polarizers and stuff like that. Um, and it turns out that, um, yeah, most sheets that we get are linear polarizers. Um, and, um, but when you do and so, so we can talk uh, about later on, uh, polarizers let through light that's got one component of linear polarization and they block light with the other component of linear polarization. Um, and when you go see 3D movies, they're at those glasses that you wear are actually, actually polarizing glasses. And what they've got are two projectors or one projector flashing two different images with two different uh, polarizations so that you see the polarizer lets through one polarization on one side and the other polarization on the other eye. And so that could be two images that your eyes then combine to make the 3D image. Um, and they started out using linear polarizers for that kind of thing, but it's kind of a pain because that's only gonna work if you keep your head and the glasses oriented the way that the polarization is, is shined onto the screen. 
if you're oriented vertically and horizontally, but then you, you're watching the movie with your head in your hand so that, that your glasses are tipped, you're going to see both sets of images in both eyes. Um, and so that doesn't work so much. So what they do instead is they have two circular polarizations, left circularly polarized and right circularly polarized. And so one eye of the glasses through left circularly polarized light, the other one lets through right circularly polarized light. And it doesn't matter which way you tip your head, a circle is still a circle. And so tipping your head doesn't change what light makes it through to your different eyes. So you can still see the two separate images and your brain combines them to create the 3D effect. Kind of cool. All right. So let's stop with this right here. Um, and I'll stay here for a minute or two if you, if you got any questions. Um, but uh, we will resume talk um, in the next class talking specifically about electromagnetic waves, where they come from, and then what happens when they strike media interfaces. Cool. All right. Good seeing you, everyone. Take care.